Good morning, everyone. What, how wonderful to be here. Shamedly, I should say, my first time in Phoenix. In fact, my first time in Arizona. That is a real shame. I apologize about that. We will definitely improve on that record. Um, Jim, how wonderful to hear you this morning uh, giving your vision for a better world. And it is so refreshing to see uh, a CEO that has really understood what we're up against and hopefully joining a growing number of CEOs who understand the issue. But you invited us to get angry. So let's just walk into that space for a moment. I am here to share with you the very sobering fact that we have just started a decade. Do you remember Happy New Year, everybody doing their New Year resolutions, Happy 2020? Well, yes, Happy 2020. And 2020 is the beginning of the decade that is actually going to decide the future of humanity. Now, I'm a Latin American woman, and we are known for hyperbole. But that is no hyperbole. That is no exaggeration. That is what science has very clearly delineated for us. It is in these next 10 years that we're actually going to decide whether humanity as a whole, for many generations to come, will still continue to be able to grow and thrive or not. And how, how, how do we get ourselves into this position? Well. Would you believe that in the past 50 years, we have actually cut down one third of the forest that we used to have? We have driven to extinction 60% of the species that we used to have, and millions of them that are still surviving are threatened with extinction today. And because we have loaded my boss, the atmosphere, with so much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, we're actually now at a concentration that we have never had ever in the history of, uh, of humanity in the atmosphere. So we have reached the moment of choice. Had we done something about this 10, 20, 30 years ago, we would probably uh, be in a much better position, but we have now backed ourselves up against the wall. And science has been very clear in saying, here's the deal. Either you get your act together and you figure out how you, means everyone, every single one of us, uh, is going to reduce our carbon emissions and all of the other greenhouse gases by one half of what we have today, by 2030, or we have created a future that is only going to be destruction, human pain, and biodiversity loss. That's it. If we are at one half the emissions by 2030, then we stand a very good chance of creating the better world that Jim was talking about, because then we have 20 more years to get to net zero by 2050, which is what we have to do. But we have a parting of the waters in 2030. What that actually means is that we have to start now, because we can't wait for 2029 and then say, oops, I forgot about that. Now we have to reduce emissions. It is something that humanity has never done. And so we have to start in a, in, in a timely fashion. Think about it as a highway. Once you get on the highway and you know you have to take an exit because it is the only right exit to get to your destination, if you pass that exit, you can go miles and miles and miles without another exit. And if you take the next exit, it is a very cumbersome way back. So this is it. We have to get it right. This is the exit that we have to take because the highway that we're on is actually an unsustainable and self-destructing highway. Now, sadly, I have to say, because I have devoted much of my life to working with national governments, national governments, honestly, they're not really working up to par. They are not doing what they should do. Exhibit one, the last international negotiation on climate change, which was in Madrid, where honestly, because of admittedly three countries, Brazil, Australia, and the United States government, we were not able to get to any decent agreements. That is very sad. In particular, that in the meantime, while they were doing this, 
Australia was burning. Australia was burning, and now we know that the burn area of Australia is one half the territory of Germany, two times the size of Belgium. We now know that one billion animals were burned to death. And we now know that the economic cost of the fires in Australia were at least 100 billion Australian dollars, 80 billion US dollars, 5% of GDP gone up literally in smoke because the government did not take the measures on climate change and on protection of their forests 15 years ago when science told them that this was coming. So I'm sorry to tell you that the doom and gloomers are actually correct. Everything that science tells us about the pernicious effects of climate change are not happening in the future, they're happening now. So I hope that that makes you angry. I hope that that makes you outraged. And frankly, I hope that that puts you into a certain degree of grief. Because it is only through facing our grief that we're actually going to find that place within us to actually do something about it and do it in a timely fashion. So, do, what, what we're seeing now is actually a, it is a, um, a show of the possible destructive world that we could walk into, but it is not unavoidable. That's the piece that we have to remember. It is possible that we walk into that world, but it is not unavoidable. And the good news is there is so much, not necessarily in national governments, but there's so much that is actually happening positively on the part of the private sector. So let me give you a couple of examples of the speed of transformation in what I call the real economy as compared to the unreal politics. So in the real economy, we have to understand that change at this point in the 21st century is no longer lineal. It is actually exponential. Did you know, and I'll give you a couple of examples on that. Did you know that worldwide, we're already at one quarter of all the electricity being produced around the world is already renewable energy. And we are on track to be at 50% renewables by 2030, which is exactly what science demands. Did you know that by large, by, by far and large, the car manufacturers, especially in other countries, but including in this country, uh, are producing electric vehicles this year that are going to be at cost parity with the old moded vehicles that have an internal combustion engine that belongs in the museum. So we will have cost parity uh, of uh, electric vehicles and the demand of cost of uh, electric vehicles is going so fast that we now have a huge investment into batteries that is going to speed that up even more. And did you know that the capital markets are shifting very, very, very uh, quickly? We have up to $12 trillion in the capital markets that have already either decided to or are already on the path to pull out that money from high carbon assets and move them over to low carbon assets. We have just recently, a couple of months ago, and, uh, and re-announced now in Davos with new members, we have a, um, a, an alliance of asset owners who are top of the financial food chain because they give instructions to asset managers and they give instructions to the companies that they partially own. Those asset owners are saying, that's it. We have now understood that there's so much risk involved in us keeping our assets in high carbon that we are now mandating our asset managers and our companies to actually move over very quickly to uh, a net zero, a net zero portfolio and a net zero operations, net zero goods and services as quickly as possible, but certainly no later uh, than 2050. And I could give you more and more examples. In this country, Larry Fink uh, wrote famously his, uh, his yearly letter that he writes saying the same thing. He manages oh, $7 trillion, not, you know, not, uh, a, not, a, not a pretty penny. Uh, and he wrote a letter saying, okay, he finally got it. He finally got it. Too risky for capital to stay there and we all have to move. So whether you see this through energy generation, whether you see it through transport, whether you see it through finance, the fact is that the real economy is moving very quickly and 
is racing toward this 2030 um, deadline. So let me come now to the waste management sector because uh, there is no doubt that given population growth and given uh, the fact that we now have increasing regulations on illegal dumping, especially in China, there's no doubt that the waste management sector is going to grow. And it too will grow exponentially. Not linearly like it has in the past, but probably exponentially. So the question is not, is the waste management sector going to grow? The question is, how is it going to grow? With what degree of sustainability? And we've had a beautiful exposition from Jim on that. But I think we can all agree that the extract, use, and discard model that we have all had, not just in that sector, but think about it. All of us individually, individually, we have grown up assuming that there's always more space for us to consume and more space for us to discard. And it is so much a part of our thinking and of our daily habits that we have actually made it the operating system of the world. Extract, discard, extract, use, discard. That operating system, my friends, has got to be discontinued. We can no longer follow that model because not only have we reached planetary boundaries, we've exceeded planetary boundaries. And once you have exceeded them, you have to come back in. You have to come back in and figure out what are we gonna do with our resources? What are we gonna do with what we poorly call our waste? So the new operating system that we have to get into our heads, into our daily habits, into our industry, is actually what I would like to call radical regeneration. And I term it that because um, that's the way that we are addressing it in an upcoming book that is coming out in which we say, you know, we really have to change our chip, our mental chip, and move away from extraction to radical regeneration. It's not just linear regeneration, no, it is radical because we have run out of time. And what that actually means is that globally, we have to be able to restore and replenish the oceans. We have to be able to restore and replenish our forests. And we have fantastic already um, announcements of, for example, a trillion trees to be planted that has just been announced in Davos last week. And we know we have the space for that. We can plant a trillion trees without impinging on land that has to be devoted to food or land that has to be devoted to urban population, even including uh, growth of urban population over uh, the next few decades. We have to be able to get into our mind that this is no longer a linear economy, this is now a circular economy. And we have to circulate everything, everything Food, packaging, fashion, second highest contaminating industry in the world after fossil fuels. Just had a very interesting conversation with the CEO of Gucci. Would you believe the CEO of Gucci is now going like, whoa, we can't continue to contaminate. We are going to transform our company. Yes, we will continue to be a luxury brand, but luxury is now going to be based on regeneration. A completely different mindset to what we had before. Building materials, obviously, manufacturing materials, you name it. Everything that we use, everything that we use. Now, we're sort of understood that one-use plastics is a no-go, but you know what? One-use anything is a no-go. If we're only using something and you put whatever you want into the something, if we're only using it once, we are committing a crime against humanity because we are deliberately impinging on humanity's possibility to continue to grow and thrive on this planet. So if we understand that, then we understand that this is not about managing waste. This is actually about completely, radically eliminating, not just, not eliminating waste, but eliminating the outmoded concept of waste. 
It is about understanding that we have to keep all our resources in a constantly evolving use cycle. And whatever is left over once we use something, that has to be the input into the next life of that. So that what we used to see as end products or waste actually become the starting materials for the next thing. And I've seen very nice examples out in the hall of that. We have to be able to think not just about recycling, but repurposing every single one of our materials and increasing the use rate of all of our assets. So let me, within that concept, let me come now to the company itself, to waste management, a company that is uh, in a privileged position, as you heard Jim say, the largest uh, landfill manager in the United States, but also uh, one of the top 10 waste management companies of the world. Well, luckily, we're in good hands uh, because the leadership of this company has actually already started this process, providing integrated environmental solutions that you've heard, reducing waste, uh, recovering valuable uh, resources that are not waste, um, and creating, certainly, their own clean, renewable uh, energy. But my boss, the global atmosphere, she calls me every morning. Unfortunately, at some point, I gave her my cell phone. Um, and she calls me anymore every morning. She goes, so Christiana, how's it going down there with the decarbonization of the global economy? And I have to report to her every day. Now, this morning's call was an interesting call because she said, I just want to remind you that your job is actually to be provocative and to push even those that are doing an excellent job. So because I have this mandate, Jim, you will forgive me if I uh, now propose that waste management as a company should actually change its name. Everyone who has fallen out of their chairs, they're either in the C-suite or in the comms team, and they will all kill me together, which is okay. Uh, but you know, I don't think waste management as a company is anymore either managing or dealing with waste. It has already surpassed that. And frankly, this is a company that is in a leadership position to show to the future. Because we have to envision this company, not for 2020, we have to envision it for 2030 and 2050, which is when these kids are going to be in the Swiss seat. So that's the vision that we have to have. And so, in this particular sector, can you imagine that this company would lead the entire sector to show the world how we can do more than anyone thinks is possible with less than anyone thinks is necessary? That is the goal of a company that operates so successfully in this sector. So, I leave that <laughs> out there in the air to be uh, considered, but I do think that there is an incredible opportunity here because we're not talking about a retrograde company, we're talking about a leading company anyway and a company that honestly can uh, not only take more steps itself, but lead the entire sector. Because getting to global one half emissions by 2030 cannot be done by individual companies. It, this is an everyone in effort. And every single company has to be able to pull its peers in to where we need to go. So let me just conclude by saying, the extract, use, and discard model is no longer viable because it has led to grave consequences, truly grave consequences. Now, you will argue, okay, but we were on that model and we didn't intentionally cause the damage that we caused, agree? Unintentional, perhaps, at least on the part of most, unintentional, but here's the deal. Unintentional just doesn't cut it anymore. Just like ignorance of the law is no defense in courts, we are now in the court of the future of humanity. And ignorance of the laws of nature is no longer an excuse 
for insufficiency of action. So whatever we did unintentionally in the past now needs to be converted from unintentional to decisively intentional and to intentionally regenerative. Because it is only through radical regeneration that we're actually going to be able to create the better world that Jim has just aspired to. So my friends, because you are here, I know that I can welcome you to the growing family of radical regenerators around the world. Thank you.